Hello, and welcome everyone to our virtual symposium this evening. Um, it's really my pleasure uh, to be introducing this this evening. Um, we're going to focus on a medical procedure update um, series of pearls of, of wisdom. And uh, we've got a lot of wisdom going on tonight, as you'll see. And we're going to focus on manometry. But before we start, I just want to remind everybody um, about our course, the ANMS um, course that will be happening in Philadelphia from August 5th to 7th. Um, looking forward to seeing everybody in person at that meeting. And also want to um, also uh, make sure everyone uh, realizes that we are having the Young Investigator Forum. Um, this is going to be happening from the 4th to, to the 7th um, in August during our ANMS meeting. And certainly we're looking forward to having a good um, uh, attendance and, and interaction at that particular meeting. Uh, remember, the abstract deadline for that particular meeting is also in April, so make sure um, that you get those abstracts in early. Uh, so without um, further delay, I, I don't want to spend too much time, but um, today we, we're fortunate to have um, Prakash Giwali and Jason Baker, um, who many of you know and really don't need an introduction. Um, Prakash really has been you know, at the forefront of high-resolution manometry. Uh, worked and trained under the tutelage of the godfather of high resolution manometry, Ray Klaus, who I know Prakash reveres and we all uh, miss uh, dearly. And then, of course, Jason Baker, as many of you know, um, has really been uh, kind of the, the standard bearer of, of the performance of esophageal function testing and all motility testing has really been a great resource for us over the years. Um, as our, our one of our main allied professionals who's really focused on that. And I'm going to hand it over the, to them so that they can focus on getting us started on this virtual symposium this evening. So thank you very much, guys. Thank you, John. And uh, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. Uh, along with my co-host, Jason Baker, uh, I'd like to welcome you to this virtual offering from uh, the American Neurogastroenterology and Motility Service. Uh, society. The, the intent here is to increase uh, knowledge and awareness of uh, uh, gastrointestinal procedures, motility procedures that are performed. Um, and, and a lot of you, a lot of the audience get to see the results, uh, get to order these tests and uh, uh, having a little bit of insight into um, how these tests can actually help uh, patients uh, will will be of value. Now, as you as we go through the talk, uh, you will see buttons at the bottom of your Zoom. Uh, one of the buttons says Q and A. Uh, uh, please post your questions there as we go along, so that we can have an interactive discussion at the end. Um, at this point, I'd like to uh, introduce my co-host Jason Baker. He's at um, uh, the Atrium Health, uh, now affiliated with Wake Forest. Um, he has really been at the forefront of uh, uh, performing uh, these uh, esophageal physiologic procedures and has a lot of insight into the actual performance, the pearls of wisdom. He actually conceived this series. And, um, and Jason, uh, I'm gonna hand it over to you to introduce the series. I uh, appreciate it. Um, well, really appreciate everybody uh, joining this uh, session. Yeah, the NMS has uh, developed this Pearls of Wisdom series of looking at a lot of testing that's done inside of a physiology lab from, from a, um, a perspective of like um, allied health people that would include um, like a physician assistant, nurses, techs, MAs, Pearls of Wisdom from their perspective and how they navigate and utilize these type of tests um, throughout their daily um, schedule. So the series really included how to develop a lab to manometry, anal rectal, and esophageal, pH, nuclear scintigraphy, and pyloric physiology. So um, we'd like to especially thank Labrie and GI Supply tonight for sponsoring this session. And I think um, everybody will find a lot of wisdom through um, Mackenzie Jarvis. She is a, a wonderful um, knowledge in this space for sure. Thank you, Jason. And uh, as you have seen, today's speaker is Dr. Mackenzie MacArthur. She's an instructor uh, in the Department of Internal Medicine and the Director of Neurogenic Bowel Program at the Atrium Health Gastroenterology and Hepatology Facility in Charlotte, um, affiliated with Wake Forest. So uh, Dr. MacArthur, MacArthur obtained her Master's of PA Medicine and Doctor of Medical Science degrees from the University of Lynchburg, she completed her Advanced Practice Provider Fellowship in Gastroenterology and Motility at Atrium Health. 
She's certified by the National Commission on Certification of PAs. Um, she's the director of the Neurogenic Bowel Program at Atrium Health and is currently practicing as a gastroenterology and motility PA. And she's also an instructor in the Department of Internal Medicine. Additionally, she's a faculty advisor for gastroenterology and hepatology for advanced practice providers. Her clinical interests include gastrointestinal dysfunction related to spinal cord injuries, uh, neuromuscular disease, and the management of complex neurogastroenterology and motility patients. Today, the topic of our talk is going to be esophageal manometry. Um, and um, uh, even though Jason introduced this as a talk for uh, allied health, this will be of immense value to all audience, uh, trainees, uh, practicing gastroenterologists, people with interest in um, uh, motility and neurogastroenterology everywhere. So uh, with that, uh, Mackenzie, uh, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Dr. Kuali, and thank you, um, Dr. Baker, for the introduction. Um, I'm really excited to speak with all of you today. I'll go ahead and share my screen. So a big thank you to GI Supply and Labori as well as ANMS for having me here today to discuss pearls of wisdom on esophageal manometries with you. Um, thank you for everyone who joined and I'm really excited to give this presentation today. Um, so first we'll just discuss the different types of dysphagia. So if a patient is coming into your motility lab or your clinic, you first want to distinguish their specific symptoms to predict the type of dysphagia that they are having. If your patient has difficulty initiating the swallows, then you want to think of more of a transfer issue, including oropharyngeal type dysphagia. Now, if you have a patient who comes in and has difficulty swallowing after the initiation of a swallow and food may stop and stick in their chest or maybe the notch of their neck, then think of more of a transport issue with esophageal dysphagia. Here's a little algorithm that we can go through whenever a patient is first presenting to you. With oropharyngeal dysphagia, you want to think more ENT type symptoms. So do they have drooling, maybe coughing, choking sensation when they eat? I often ask when you eat or drink, do you cough and choke? Or what about do you wake up in the middle of the night coughing and choking? This can give me some more information if they have oropharyngeal dysphagia, as well as aspiration. Do they have a history of aspiration pneumonia? And then they localize their dysphagia to high in the neck and in the throat. And these patients, you may want to think about getting a modified barium swallow to further evaluate with speech pathology and speech therapy to determine if they have difficulties with different types of consistencies of food or if they're aspirating or having flash penetration during the study. And that's different than esophageal dysphagia. So this is the food sticking retrosternally, maybe regurgitation, chest pain, and their localization is going to be sternal notch or below. So how do you determine the cause of oropharyngeal dysphagia? So one of my favorite cases that actually happened right whenever I became a PA and I joined um, Dr. Moshery at Atrium in neurogastroenterology was a patient who had come from an outside hospital with an esophageal manometry that had a hypotensive upper esophageal sphincter on a esophageal manometry and absent peristalsis. So there was no peristalsis of the esophagus and the history was a 20 year old male without any history of a systemic um, disease at all that would cause this. So we saw the patient in clinic afterwards and we took a history and a really good physical exam and noticed that he had muscle wasting and thenar atrophy. We then sent the patient to rheumatology, neurology, and genetics, and he was diagnosed with myotonic dystrophy. So realizing oropharyngeal dysphagia using our manometry and history and physical exam is extremely important for making a diagnosis, as well as our patients with maybe a stroke history, Parkinson's, MS, all of these things can be important and you may catch it on your physical exam. You may be the first one. And radiology, including CTs and plain films are extremely important. Speech pathology and speech therapy, as we alluded to previously. 
endoscopic procedures, especially if a mass is seen on a CT, esophageal manometry, which we'll be discussing in great detail today, and endoscopic ultrasound if evaluating lesions for more structural etiologies. So what are some of the etiologies of oropharyngeal dysphagia? This is going to be important when determining which type of testing you should do. And then as well, if you are trying to figure out if there is a specific problem that you may need different treatment for. So iatrogenic, such as a medication side effect as chemotherapy, radiation. Um, I had a patient the other day who came in for dysphagia after having tonsillar cancer and had chemotherapy and radiation. And I ordered a modified barium swallow and he was having laryngeal penetration and aspiration. And I treated him for oropharyngeal dysphagia. You can also have infectious causes such as Lyme's disease or syphilis. Metabolic amyloidosis is one that we don't often think of, but we actually have an amyloidosis multidisciplinary clinic at Atrium Health with our cardiologists as well as neurologists. Myopathic disorders, like we talked about myotonic dystrophy, polymyositis, dermatomyositis, connective tissue diseases, these can all be etiologies of oropharyngeal dysphagia. Neurological head trauma, such as our spinal cord injury patients, Guillain-Barre, multiple sclerosis, um, and Parkinson's. We have a wide population of Parkinson's with oropharyngeal dysphagia. And we can't leave out our post-COVID syndrome patients who may have neurological diseases from their COVID. So they we're often seeing patients who now have oropharyngeal and esophageal dysphagia after having COVID-19. And then structural causes, such as a zanker diverticulum, cervical webs, and osteophytes, which we'll talk about a little bit more in detail. Here's just an example of a structural etiology, a zanker diverticulum. This causes extrinsic narrowing of the anterior esophageal lumen. And then extrinsic lesion. So this can also cause oropharyngeal type dysphagia. For example, the other day I was called into the motility lab by our motility nurse, and she noted that she kept hitting something solid when she would place the esophageal manometry. Well, upon reviewing the records and reviewing the cervical x-rays that they had had, this patient had osteophytes. So they had DISH, diffuse idiopathic skeletal hypertosis, which is where the spinal ligaments and osteophytes become hardened and calcified, and they can stick into the esophagus causing dysphagia. This can be a serious um, problem for patients who are trying to swallow, and us as allied health members may see this when we're trying to place a manometry catheter, as well as thyroid enlargement, tumors, cervical lymphadenopathy, and vascular anomalies such as dysphagia lasoria. This is an algorithm for esophageal dysphagia. So we've already gone through oropharyngeal dysphagia, which is the initiation of a swallow. They have difficulty with this, with coughing, choking, maybe nasal regurgitation. Now moving on to esophageal dysphagia. This is a sensation that a patient will say, it gets stuck in my esophagus in my chest after a few seconds of initiating the swallow. We'll move on to solid. So solid food esophageal dysphagia. Think more of a mechanical obstruction. If it's progressive, especially in an older adult with significant weight loss, maybe iron deficiency anemia, then think about esophageal cancer. This always has to be on the back of our mind. And progressive with chronic heartburn, think more peptic stricture. If it's a mechanical type obstruction with non-progressive symptoms, then think of more of an inflammatory process such as eosinophilic esophagitis or an esophageal ring. Now moving back up to the top of our graph at esophageal dysphagia with solids and liquids, I'll also ask that you want to ask your patients if they have dysphagia to their own saliva as well. This can give you key information if they're having difficulty even swallowing their own saliva. That's extremely debilitating for them. And think more of a motor disorder. A progressive motor disorder with regurgitation, maybe respiratory symptoms and weight loss, think about achalasia. If they have chronic heartburn, think absent peristalsis, maybe scleroderma. If it's a motor disorder that's intermittent, 
It could be a primary or secondary esophageal motility disorder that we'll go through today. Etiologies of esophageal dysphagia. We went through some of these, but malignancy, peptic stricture, infectious esophagitis, rings and webs, these can all be mechanical obstructions. Extrinsic, so our dysphagia lasoria with an aberrant subclavian artery. We can often see this on an esophageal manometry. Sometimes patients are even asymptomatic and we find it on a esophageal manometry if they're getting it for something else. But some of the symptoms could be chest pain or dysphagia with dysphagia lasoria. Cervical osteophytes that we mentioned, an enlarged aorta can also be seen on a manometry. And then motility disorders that we'll go into more detail. Now, I get this question probably multiple times a week. What are the indications for an esophageal manometry and when should I send my patient to get one? It is the gold standard to evaluate for an esophageal motility disorder. You want to think about ordering this in any patient who has dysphagia, GERD that may be resistant to standard therapy, and we may need placement of a pH or acid reflux sensor. For non-cardiac chest pain to roll out distal esophageal spasms or hypercontractile esophageal pattern, assisting in the diagnosis of a systemic disease that may be affecting the smooth muscle or autonomic nervous system, such as we discussed, like our myotonic dystrophy patient or our patients with Parkinson's disease. In preoperative evaluations for Nissen and Toupe fund applications, we work very closely with our foregut surgery team, hiatal hernia and parasophageal hernia repairs, and then post anti reflux surgery dysphagia, which is, is extremely common. And what are the relative contraindications? So esophageal varices, that's an absolute contraindication. Epistaxis, caution with esophageal structures or diverticulums. There is risk of perforation with a diverticulum. A previous severe nasal fracture or deviated septum. Now there is a trick that is a contraindication, but for our allied health members who are actually performing the esophageal manometry test you can use a mouth guard and insert the manometry through the mouth with a mouth guard, but you have to be extremely careful with this because our catheters are extremely sensitive with sensors on them. And if the patient bites down, that could be detrimental. Um, so there is an option, but we have to be extremely careful and counsel the patient not to bite down on the manometry catheter. And this is extremely important. Uh, a relative contraindication is a patient with an altered mental status who cannot understand instructions such as cognitive impairment or even autism spectrum disorder in some cases, because we do ask them to do specific maneuvers. We ask them to take one swallow at a time, not multiple swallows at a time. And we may do provocative testing with doing multiple rapid swallows as well. Um, so that is difficult if you um, have cognitive impairment. And then an esophageal manometry. So this is a catheter that is placed through the nose, into the pharynx, through the esophagus, and then through the LES, the lower esophageal sphincter, into the stomach. It measures UES pressure, upper esophageal sphincter pressure, esophageal body pressure, and lower esophageal sphincter pressure. So we get a lot of measurements and it gives us a significant amount of information for our patients. Here's what the equipment looks like. So this is the catheter that I was discussing with all of the sensors. It's very sensitive and it picks up all of the muscle contractions of the esophagus. And for our allied health members, this is the machine that you use um, to determine the esophageal motor pattern and how you measure the motility disorder. So this is what the setup kind of looks like in our motility lab. And now we'll just go through a normal esophageal manometry. So at the top um, here is an upper esophageal sphincter. And let me see if my pen will work here. So here is the upper esophageal sphincter. This is the upper esophageal sphincter relaxation. Striated muscle tissue is here. And that is why our myotonic 
um, dystrophy patient or our muscle neurological type conditions are affected, the upper esophageal sphincter is because it is striated muscle. As well as this is our esophageal body, which is smooth muscle contraction. And this is the lower esophageal sphincter here with the lower esophageal sphincter relaxation. And we'll go into more detail about all of these. Now, how I learned how to read esophageal manometries is it should look like a good hockey stick. So we should have a great line here and a hockey stick. This little break that you see here is the transition zone. So this is normal in a patient um, to have a good transition zone. Now, what's the approach to interpreting a high resolution esophageal manometry? We want to assess the pressure. So first, the upper esophageal sphincter. We look at how the pressure is contracting and what is the relaxation duration. The lower esophageal sphincter pressure, including the residual mean pressure, the integrated relaxation pressure, which we'll discuss later on, and the respiratory mean pressure. Does the esophageal gastric junction relax with swallows? And is there a hiatal hernia present? Then we assess the esophageal body. What is the contractile pattern, such as spasms? And is there peristalsis absent or um, present? And amplitudes, are they high or low? The integrated relaxation pressure, or the IRP, is the assessment of the EGJ junction, and normal is less than 17. A high IRP indicates that the lower esophageal sphincter is not relaxing appropriately. So here is the IRP that we were discussing, which indicates the LES is relaxing appropriately in this image. And we'll discuss why the IRP is so important in going through the diagnosis on esophageal manometries. The distal contractile interval is the assessment of the total peristaltic pressure within the esophageal body. Normal is between 450 and 8,000. If it is less than 450, then think about our hypo contractile pattern, such as ineffective esophageal motility pattern or absent peristalsis. If it is over 8,000, think hyper contractile pattern, such as jackhammer, nutcracker, um, that we used to uh, talk about before. And this is the measurement of the DCI. So it's the esophageal body. And this will give us a calculation for hypo and hypercontractile patterns. Distal latency. So this is the assessment of premature esophageal spasms. It measures the contractile deceleration point. A distal latency over 4.5 seconds is normal. Less than 4.5, that's when we want to think about our intermittent simultaneous contractions or esophageal spasms. So in the picture B here, you can see that the distal latency is 4, which is less than 4.5. And this is an intermittent simultaneous contraction, which measures the, contract, the contractile deceleration point is measured in seconds to give us that number. And here is the Chicago classification 4.0. I know this looks like a really busy slide, but we'll go through it in more detail. So after Allied Health has performed the 10 wet swallows, then we move on to our algorithm. The first thing that you want to know is what is the IRP? Is the IRP normal? If it is normal, then move over to the right to disorders of peristalsis. We want to make sure that we've done our wet swallows and the secondary positions with multiple rapid swallows, more provocative testing. If there's an elevated LES, IRP, in varying positions, then you want to move on. If there is not an elevated LES, IRP, then we move towards our disorders of peristalsis. So if there's 100% failed peristalsis, this is considered absent contractility. If there's greater than or equal to 20% of swallows with premature contractions, this is distal esophageal spasm. If there is greater than or equal to 20% of swallows with a hypercontractility pattern, this is hypercontractile esophagus. If greater than 70% are ineffective swallows, 
or greater than or equal to 50% are failed swallows, this is ineffective esophageal motility pattern. That encompasses our disorders of peristalsis. If our IRP is abnormal, we move back up to the top. If there's 100% absent peristalsis in all swallows, we want to think about our aclasia disorders. And these are disorders of EGJ outflow. If there is 100% failed peristalsis without panesophageal pressurization, then think about type 1 aclasia. If there is 100% failed peristalsis with panesophageal pressurization and greater than or equal to 20% of swallows, then think type 2 aclasia. If there's greater than or equal to 20% with premature contractions and failed peristalsis with panesophageal pressurization that may or may not be present, then that's type 3 aclasia. Now, if the IRP is still abnormal and there is not 100% peristalsis moved down to thinking about EGA outflow obstruction. Now you must have an abnormal time barium swallow or endoflip to make that diagnosis. We'll go through that in more detail. And I just wanted this slide to note that yes, esophageal manometries are extremely important in the diagnosis, but we also need to utilize our other diagnostic testing to get the whole picture. So as an allied health member who may be performing the esophageal manometry study, you always want to make sure that you review the records prior to doing the esophageal manometry. You may want to review a barium swallow, for example, as this one shows a dilated fluid-filled esophagus with a tapering lower esophageal sphincter. This is a classic bird speaking. And if you have this information prior, to doing the esophageal manometry, you may be already thinking aclasia and knowing what you're going to find or if any difficulties may occur. And then over to the right is an endoscopic view of aclasia showing the dilated esophagus and a tight LES pressure. Now going into more detail, um, so type one aclasia has that abnormal median IRP and 100% failed peristalsis. So this shows an example of an IRP of over 17. It is 21.2, which is abnormal, and the DCI is zero. There's no great hockey stick here. It's completely absent. That's type one aclasia. Type two aclasia, abnormal median IRP with 100% failed peristalsis and greater than or equal to 20% of swallows with panesophageal pressurization. We can see our IRP is elevated at 35.3, which is much greater than 17. We have our streaks of green and yellow, which is panesophageal pressurization and 100% failed peristalsis, type two aclasia. Type three aclasia. So this is where we may want to think about opioids. So sometimes opioids can be associated with type three aclasia. And this is the perfect time to note that any esophageal manometry should be done completely off opioids, unless the patient has extenuating circumstances. So opioids can affect the esophageal motility and cause spastic contractions as well. So we want to have our patients off of opioids prior to doing esophageal manometries. And type three aclasia will have an abnormal median IRP with 20% greater than or equal to 20% of swallows with premature spastic contractions, no evidence of peristalsis. So our elevated IRP and normal DCI with a distal latency of 3.9, and premature spastic contractions is type three aclasia. Now, aclasia treatment. So after we make the diagnosis on esophageal manometry, then what do we do? So surgical therapy is going to be our go-to with a laparoscopic myotomy or a perioral endoscopic myotomy called POEM. So I just included a little image here to the right. So dye is injected in a POEM procedure and this is done by our advanced endoscopists or foregut surgeons. And an incision is made in the inner layer of the esophagus within the mucosa, and they tunnel, which is made in the esophageal wall mucosal layer, and it's cut and divided. And this is what a poem entails. 
There's also endoscopic therapy such as pneumatic dilation or Botox injections to the LES. And then there is pharmacological therapy as well, but this should always be reserved for our patients who may not be able to have surgical procedures or endoscopic procedures due to their other comorbidities. But you can think about using nitrates, calcium channel blockers, or phosphodiesterase inhibitors for treatment of aplasia. And then disorders of EGA outflow obstruction. These are further classified by Dr. Macy with Wisconsin. Um, and this is, you can see a hypercontractile feature of EGA outflow obstruction, as well as no evidence of disordered peristalsis with EGA outflow obstruction. This has an abnormal median IRP while supine and upright and greater than or equal to 20% elevated intrabolus pressure while supine. It does not meet criteria for aclasia as it does have peristalsis, but an abnormal IRP. So in this example here to the left, the IRP is 18.2, DCI is over 8,000, uh, which is 10,000, and this is a hypercontractile feature of EGA outflow obstruction. And it is extremely important to note that based on the Chicago classification 4.0, Manometric diagnosis of EGA outflow obstruction is always considered clinically inconclusive. So it does require clinically relevant symptoms, including dysphagia or non-cardiac chest pain, with at least one supportive investigational study, as seen here on the right, a time barium esophagram, which measures the emptying of the esophagus, as well as endoflip, which gives us information about retrograde contractions, um, as well as the distensibility of the LES. And this is done during an endoscopy. Moving on to disorders of peristalsis. So this is a hypercontractile esophageal pattern. You will have a normal IRP and greater than or equal to 20% hypercontractile swallows. So within the 10 wet swallows that are performed by our allied health members, at least two of those have to be over 8,000 distal contractile interval. And it was previously referred to as jackhammer or nutcracker, so you may still hear this, and it's often associated with comorbidities um, such as anxiety or depression or psychiatric disorders. And you can see the IRP here is less than 17, which is normal at 11.7, .7, and this big contraction here the DCI is over 8,000. And you can see there is a hockey stick, but there is a large contraction of an elevated DCI. And then distal esophageal spasm. So you will have a normal median IRP with greater than or equal to 20% of swallows with premature or spastic contractions. So you will have that normal IRP shown in an example here is 12.1 a normal DCI less than 8,000, this one is 5,000, and then a decreased distal latency at 3.2. So if you remember the distal latency is normal if it is over 4.5. And this slide is extremely important. So you've made your diagnosis of either a hypercontractile esophageal uh, motility disorder or distal esophageal spasm. Now what do we do? If acid reflux um, evaluation has not been completed, then you want to make sure you do an acid reflux evaluation to determine the etiology of an esophageal dysmotility or distinguish the treatment. So if there is pathological acid reflux that is found on pH testing, then you want to treat the acid reflux. You wanna maximize PPI therapy, GERD diet lifestyle modifications, and consider an anti-reflux surgical evaluation with our four gut surgeons. If there's a lack of acid reflux on pH testing, but you still have hypercontractile or esophageal spasms, think about pharmacological therapy, such as calcium channel blockers, even peppermint oil, nitrates, phosphodiesterase inhibitors, and tricyclic antidepressants are all useful. And then you can use Botox injections to the area of spasm seen in endoscopy. Moving on to ineffective esophageal motility pattern. So ineffective esophageal motility pattern or IEM can be seen in patients who have had chronic acid reflux for a significant amount of their life. 
as well as this can be seen in connective tissue diseases, um, more systemic diseases, autoimmune disorders. It has a normal median IRP with greater than or equal to 70% ineffective swallows or greater than or equal to 50% failed peristalsis. So you can see in this example here that the DCI is less than 450 and is 178 with a normal IRP. And you can just see that there's no great hockey stick here. It's a weak hockey stick, like I like to say. And then absent contractility. You will have a normal median IRP. That's what makes it different than type one aclasia. So in type one aclasia, you'll have a high IRP with absent contractility. But in absent contractility, esophageal and motility disorder, you'll have a normal median IRP with 100% failed peristalsis. And in this example, you can see the IRP less than 17 at 6.8 and DCI is zero. Now, IEM and absent peristalsis treatment. So what do we do after we make the diagnosis of this? We want to first determine the etiology of the motility disorder. Does your patient have scleroderma that is causing their absent peristalsis? Is there a connective tissue disease or do they have high volume acid reflux that may be leading to their IEM? You wanna make sure that you give them aspiration precautions. So making sure they're not eating four to six hours prior to bedtime, raising their head of the bed, using PPI and H2 blockers at night to prevent acid from having aspiration at that time. All of these things, you may want to order a modified barium swallow with speech pathology as well. You want to do GERD diet and lifestyle modification. And then you can consider prokinetic therapy, such as buspirone, which has been shown to improve motor function in the esophagus, and bethanicol and procalopride, which are pure prokinetics, and domperidon, which is a mixed prokinetic. All of these can be used to aid in the esophageal motility function. And this is my last slide. So a diagnosis of a hiatal hernia can be seen on high resolution esophageal manometry. Hiatal hernias are seen by the separation of the diaphragm from the lower esophageal sphincter, and this can be seen by pressure patterns. High resolution esophageal manometry gives real time localization of the EGJ component to determine if it's a sliding hiatal hernia and gives the ability to measure the size of the hernia. This is the lower esophageal sphincter, and you can see that there is a gap here, which represents the um, the separation of the diaphragm from the lower esophageal sphincter, which is a hiatal hernia. So that is what I have for my presentation um, today. And thank you so much for um, joining us. And now we'll answer some questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mackenzie. That was a wonderful presentation. Very comprehensive, covered covered all the areas. We've had a very nice response and the questions, and I think Jason and I, and I will uh, will go back and forth uh, in asking questions. Let me start with the first one we have. Um, I think this is from a, a pediatric practitioner who, who writes that in children, when they see vascular rings, uh, they take uh, these as significant uh, only if there are symptoms. Um, in the absence of symptoms, these are considered a normal variant. So I, 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 the question is, is it the same in adults? Are there any correlates of uh, uh, vascular obstruction on manometry? How do we, how do we uh, evaluate or how do we approach these patients? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so whenever we're reading an esophageal manometry, I always take in the, the history of the patient. So if the patient is having more dysphagia, chest pain, then obviously you want to take it more serious if you see some type of cardiac contraction. So for example, if you see dysphagia lasoria, you may want to think about getting a CT angiography or some type of vascular study to determine if that is really what's causing their dysphagia and their chest pain. Another example of a cardiac contraction that we see may be in the mid esophageal body, and this could be a cardiomegaly. So if we see this and it's pretty significant throughout the study and the patient has chest pain, we may consider um, writing on the report to get an echocardiogram 
and following up with their cardiologist to get more information about that. Uh, Mackenzie, we have another question talking about UES relaxation. Um, what is your recommendations? Do you check it at uh, different check time points, like 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.8 seconds? It varies in the literature. What's your opinion on evaluating the upper esophageal relaxation? That's a great question. So usually if I have a question about the UES relaxation, I do two things. So one, you can go to the resting pressure, which is just the baseline pressure of an esophageal manometry. And you can use what's called the smart mouth. So the smart mouth is a specific measurement that you can move your cursor over the the contraction of the esophagus and it'll give you a real time answer for that. Then I go to the other swallows and I can look at what the pressure is and if it is having good relaxation. You want to use typically a two second window um, is what we use and there's no standard, but typically two seconds is what's used. Thank you, Mackenzie. And the next question relates to IRP. Um, and uh, this this audience member was a little confused because they've they've read about uh, IRP having a threshold of 15. You said 17. Others say 21. Um, obviously, different manufacturers are at play. But uh, what's what's your uh, response to uh, what what is the standard IRP, or is it does it vary between uh, different manufacturers? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So when we move from Chicago classification 3.0 to 4.0, the mindset was more to go towards over 17 than 15, um, but it is different on different manufacturers. Um, and you also need to take in effect the provocative testing. So if you have a normal or even an elevated IRP, you may wanna look at the rapid swallow sequence as well as upright versus supine swallows. That's what's important on the Chicago classification to make sure that we've done this provocative testing to get a real accurate IRP. Um, and this was also because we were tending to overcall EGA outflow obstruction. So we wanted to make sure that we did this provocative testing to get a real IRP for that. Um, Mackenzie, so during manometry, do you recommend using uh, having greater than 10 swallows, or do you just pick the 10 best swallows, or do you analyze all of them and try to choose 10 analyzable swallows, or you just do 10 and end a study? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so uh, we do do the baseline as well, and then we have 10 great swallows. Um, that's with wet swallows that we go through. We also, and that's what's counted um, towards the Chicago classification but we do utilize applesauce swallows um, as well because that gives us an opportunity to test our patients in more of a solid state dysphagia. So if your patient doesn't have liquid dysphagia but only solid dysphagia, um, then we want to make sure that we're evaluating that as well as the provocative testing that we mentioned before. So those are not calculated specifically on the manometry for the Chicago classification, but we are doing those studies after the 10 best wet swallows. Um, and then especially, like for example, I had a patient today actually in clinic um, that had a modified barium swallow that was only aspirating liquids and not solids. So they were fine with solids and pureed types of food, but they needed an esophageal manometry. In that case, I may ask our motility nurse or allied health member to only do solids with apple sauces, um, just so I make sure my patient is not aspirating in that sense. So essentially what she's saying is you can't pick and choose. You take 10 best swallows, the well-performed swallows, 10 in sequence. Otherwise, you won't be able to make these uh, hypermotility uh, diagnoses. So next question, at your institution, uh, or at others that you're aware of, are POEM procedures performed by an advanced endoscopist or a combined procedure with the CT surgeon? And the rest of us may chime in too as to what is done in our institutions. Uh, Mackenzie. Yes, yes, please chime in. Um, so in our institution, we do have our four gut surgeons are mainly um, the ones who are currently doing POEM and we have a very close relationship with them. So we do the preoperative workup, whether that's barium, upper GIs, um, endoscopy, and then the esophageal manometry and pH study. 
And then I did mention we are doing post anti reflux um, evaluation as well. For POEM procedure, you know, you have to worry about increased levels of acid reflux afterwards um, as well. So we are doing those studies. So uh, just to add to that, uh, th there is a history behind uh, how POEM uh, has been performed, because in the beginning, um, this was a, 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 a replacement or a, a, an equivalent for a heller myotomy. And when it was not being uh, covered by insurance, it was done in the operating room. And clearly, the operating rooms are controlled by the surgeon. So it, it had to be a combined procedure with a, with a, a foregut surgeon or a CT surgeon, even if the advanced endoscopist was doing the dissection. But now in many centers, this has moved out of the OR into the advanced endoscopist suite. Um, and uh, as, as the operator becomes more familiar and the anesthesiologists and support people become more familiar with, uh, with the post poem situation, um, these uh, procedures are probably gonna move out of the OR into an advanced endoscopist uh, suite uh, in, in the time to come because now uh, POEM is going to be covered or will be covered or is being covered as an independent procedure. Um, and Mackenzie, how, how, what's your recommendation? How long should a patient be off narcotics before an esophageal manometry? Yeah, so it's really patient dependent on how long they should be off, but we typically say that they should be off for at least um, 48 hours, um, but you know, longer if possible, um, ideally 48 hours. Um, what about in Michigan? Did you guys take people off opioids as well? And what about you, Dr. Kowali? Uh, Jason? At Michigan, we, we, we did not, we performed, um, we left it up to the ordering provider to make that decision. Yeah, and, and similarly uh, at Washington University, there's a follow-up question here and I'm gonna uh, mention the question. I'm, uh, I'm gonna uh, tell you my, my point of view on this. Um, the question is, what are the odds of stopping these medications for high resolution manometry? And um, uh, how, how do you sort this out? And uh, the, 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 there are two schools of thought here. One is you're doing the procedure on opiates because the patient's symptomatic and you want to prove a point that you want, you want to prove that there is a, a, a spastic process or a type 3 achalasia EGJ outflow obstruction process on opiates. And then you can counsel the patient that this kind of pattern is seen uh, with opiates and maybe you need to stop. Um, that's one school of thought. Another school of thought is, I don't want to see anything that is reversible on my manometry, so let's get these patients off. But I think the reality is somewhere in between. There are patients who will probably not stop these medications, uh, even if they may stop it for a couple of days for the procedure, they'll go right back on it. So maybe you want to know what's going on uh, with the medicines on board in some instances. Yes, completely agree. And especially, you know, our patients who... I, I mean, I see a lot of patients with spinal cord injuries um, and who have may had trauma in the past. So there's no way that we can possibly get them off of their baclofen pump and their opioids and all of that. So those are especially extenuating circumstances, as well as our patients who may have cancer and things like that. Um, so some patients just cannot be off of them. And that's completely understandable. Now, Mackenzie, the next one was, uh, do antispasmodics like Lepsin work for esophageal spasms? Yeah, so you can definitely try Lepsin, Bintel. Um, Lepsin probably better because you can use it sublingual. Um, but really what we have found is that nitroglycerin, sublingual, calcium channel blockers, if you need a longer acting mechanism of action or phosphodiesterase inhibitors may be better. Um, so that's what I would say is maybe use one of the other ones instead, but definitely Lepsin and Bintel have lower risk of things like lowering your blood pressure, um, headaches, things like that. And there was a, another question that is uh, related. Um, uh, what about Botox? Um, how, how do you use it in, in these patients with spasm? How do you determine where to inject and then how do you, how do you make the, the diagnosis that leads to Botox, uh, manometry, barium? And then when you inject Botox, there's lots of different parts to this. Uh, how long does it last? 
Yeah, so those are all great questions. Um, so I do not perform endoscopy, but um, so my attending, Dr. Moshri, she will most of the time do endoflip as well during her um, endoscopy. And you can actually see the spasm. So especially if a patient has been diagnosed, maybe on an esophageal manometry with distal esophageal spasms or hyper contractile esophageal spasm, as well as EGA outflow obstruction. So if you use endoflip, you see there's a tight LES, a low sensibility. Um, then you can inject Botox in the LES to open that area up. As well as if you have distal esophageal spasms and you're doing endoflip and you can actually see the spasms, you can inject Botox within those spasms. Um, and then for the question of how long does it last? So typically three to six months. If it's less than that, then it there seems to be some placebo effect, I think, as well in some of these patients, um, but really six months. We want to be careful with doing it frequently because these patients will come back and they'll ask repeatedly for Botox, and you will see that, um, but it can lead to some scarring of the tissue, so we want to be careful with doing it consistently, but there's no great studies for doing this empirically as well, so we really need evidence-based medicine, medicine to figure this out. Um, and, you know, it is preferred in patients who have narcotic dysmotility as well. And that's, that's, a, that's a very excellent, that's an excellent summary. I, I would just add to that, that uh, I wouldn't take the word spasm to mean real contraction. When patients say they have spasm, they mean they have pain, they have discomfort. Yep. It doesn't mean that this muscle is contracting vigorously. Some of these patients have functional disorders. So it's really useful to understand why they're having symptoms. And that's where these tests come in. So if there is a transit problem, if food or uh, what, it, what they're eating sticks in the esophagus and does not move through, that's where uh, treatments like Botox or even these calcium blockers and, uh, and smooth muscle relaxants work the best. Now, if food is not holding up, if it is moving, through and they have a chest sensation that they're calling spasm, sometimes those patients need neuromodulators because they're manifesting esophageal hypersensitivity rather than an actual muscle contraction, even though they call it spasm. And we call it spasm too. We're not always very precise in how we, how we use these terms. Yeah. And that's what I was going to say as well is that the pH testing is also extremely important. So it's going to determine how you're going to treat these patients. So you would never want to do Botox injections to the spasm at LES if your patient has high volume reflux. It's just going to make it worse. So you always need to make sure that you're doing that as well in your evaluation. And then we often use SSRIs and um, Buspar is one that we use, which is a 5-HT1A um, receptor agonists to try and help esophageal motor function. Um, it also seems to help that anxiety component that goes along with spasms that patients are having and globus sensation. So if your patient has a lot of globus sensation, then it may help as a neuromodulator with that. Um, Mackenzie, uh, how is the IRP interpreted post fund application? Is it different? Is there a different value for normal? Yeah, um, so we can evaluate the IRP in a fund application. We know that it is going to be elevated. Um, it just depends on how elevated. So there's no standard. Um, but if we are reading esophageal manometry and there is an elevated IRP in a history with a fund application, that would not be abnormal. And Dr. Gwali, you may have more to add to that. Uh, yes, again, um, I, I would say that um, you, know, you would expect uh, that uh, there will be IRP at the high end of normal or just above, and usually ignore that if the patient is asymptomatic. So it really depends on why you did the procedure in the first place. Now, if you see pressure compartmentalization in the esophagus, the patient has dysphagia, maybe that means something. And uh, you, you might do something to the wrap, open it up a little bit with dilation or so on. But uh, again, in the asymptomatic patient, uh, you want the wrap to function like a levy, right? Uh, you, you want it to be a dam. So yes, you, you are intending for that IRP to be a little high. There are a couple of studies um, and um, uh, you know, they report that the values can be 
you know, uh, with the Medtronic system, 16, 17, 18, and that can still be taken as, as, as normal. I think we'll have to end the, the, the live Q&A uh, at, at this point. Uh, any remaining questions can be answered through Doc Matter. This is the online community for the ANMS. Um, and uh, we encourage everybody in the audience to, to, to join in the discussion and we will make sure that uh, Mackenzie participates in this as well and answers questions through Doc Matter. So anybody is welcome, anybody with access to Doc Matter is welcome to post their questions at, in Doc Matter. And those of you who are not members of uh, ANMS, please join us. We'd love to have you as, as members uh, of, the, of the ANMS and uh, you, can, you can see all the different benefits you can get for your patient management, for community discussions, um, attending meetings, uh, and so on and so forth. And with that, I'm gonna hand over to Jason to make some final comments. Yeah, this has been a wonderful session. Thank you for Mackenzie for such a robust uh, uh, review of esophageal manometry and how you work your, through patients and your clinic and your experience. Um, I just have one, one more little question for Mackenzie, if you can answer a little quickly, but uh, what would be your recommendations for physician assistants, nurse practitioners who want to learn more about esophageal manometry, maybe seek this out as their professional uh, expertise and pearls of wisdom from how you've got from the beginning to where you're at now. Yes, yeah, so great final question, um, Dr. Baker, thank you. Um, so really, I would say find what you're passionate about. Um, that's number one. So I have always been extremely passionate about neurogastroenterology um, due to my sister's history. She had Guillain-Barre. So I saw the effects of the GI tract. So that really sparked my interest. Find a great mentor. I've had so many mentors. Um, Dr. Moshri, motility expert, has been my mentor since I started. And learn as much as you can. Go to, um, you know, ANMS and GAP and all of these places. And that's how you're going to meet all of the world experts. Um, to learn more. So I would say that's, um, that's definitely my advice is to find a great mentor and keep learning as much as you can. Outstanding. Well, we appreciate everybody for um, joining us tonight. Um, the conversation will continue on Doc Matters, like Dr. Wally said. Uh, we hope to see all of you there and hope you see at the next uh, um, Pearls of Wisdom presentations throughout this year. Have a good night, great. everybody.